Vince Huckelbarf here with another episode of the IT Business Podcast, the show for IT professionals where we talk tech, try to help you run your business better, smarter, and faster. This is the Wednesday Live Show. I have a guest waiting in the green room, and if you've paid attention to the last couple of audio podcasts, you will recognize the name, Karen Nabb, an executive leadership coach doing all that she can to help us understand how to communicate better, resolve conflict, all those good things that we as techies don't do so well with people because we love machines. So we're going to work on all of that tonight. If you're new to the show, uh, this is a, uh, it's kind of a little techie show. It, sometimes we get geeky. A lot of times we don't, uh, I share stories and tips and products and all that sort of stuff. But then we go out of our lane sometimes to bring in leadership topics, business topics. That's what we're here for. Thus, the IT Business Podcast. You can find everything you need to know over at itbusinesspodcast.com. You can subscribe to any of the podcatchers and catch the audio shows. You can also sign up and follow us on any of the social medias. We are on LinkedIn, YouTube, and the Facebook. So that is all you need to know there. Uh, Before I bring Karen out, I need to go over just a little bit of news. Uh, One of the stories that I wanted to get to is I saw an article in Slashdot today where it talks about why companies are leaving the cloud. The reason I want to bring this up as a quick news story is because I have a lot of law firm clients, which most of you don't want to deal with because you think attorneys are, well, whatever you think they are. And to some degree, they are. But one of the things is is they are slow to adopt cloud stuff. Now, there are a ton of cloud-based law firm programs, billing programs and stuff, but a lot of the big programs are still terrestrial. They still require on-prem service, and a lot of my clients are the ones that have those servers. So I always talk about the fact that not everybody's so quick to go to the cloud. So I just thought it was interesting – that this article in Slashdot says that 25% of organizations surveyed, surveyed in the United Kingdom have already moved half or more of their cloud-based workloads back to on-premises infrastructures. And this was according to a recent study by Citrix. Uh, the survey questioned 350 IT leaders on their current approaches to cloud commuting, And it also showed that 93% of respondents had been involved with a cloud repatriation project in the past three years. Now, it gives a whole bunch of reasons as to what that is and why that is. Uh, Talked about unexpected cost, performance, compatibility, blah, blah, blah. I will have a link to that in the show notes so you can go and uh, give your comments as well on that. So see, folks. You can't make fun of me because my clients aren't going to the cloud. People are going to the cloud and coming back. So that's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, I also want to do a quick little shout out. Now, there is a conference happening down here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It is the big expo that I have talked about before. It's a combination IT expo, MSP expo, and a couple of other expo thingies. It's at the Broward County Convention Center. And I'll be headed over there tomorrow to check out the swag and see how how that stuff compares. But I, I want to give a couple of shout outs. Now these this is not your normal shout out. So last year when I was there, I got to hang out with Mr. Matt Scully uh and his lady friend from Kaseya. And uh this year Scully's there and didn't reach out. Scully, I'm upset. Dude, I took you to a great restaurant last year. You could have at least said, hello, Uncle Marv, I'm in the area. So, Scully, I'm calling you out for that. Uh, I'm also calling out Nancy, the girl with a thousand tattoos, who is here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I believe you sponsor the podcast and didn't say hello or anything that you were down here. And my newest friend, Char, Charlene. Miss Hawaii here in Fort Lauderdale, a speaker nonetheless, leading a panel 20 minutes from my office. Again, 
not doing a shout out or saying hello. And listen, folks, I have to thank people like the Millers and the Dubinskys and the Morazes and everybody that when they get into town, they say hello. But for those of you that are supposed to be my friends, say hello when you come to my town. So um, I do want to say thank you to Tolaris, uh, Tolaris, formerly TCG. Uh, is the company that I use when I resell internet services, phones, and other assorted services. They got bought by Tolaris, and they invited me and the wife to a nice little dinner, 15th Street Fisheries. So I want to say thank you to Rob Hill for bringing me out there. I got to meet some nice people, uh, Therese, Michelle, Nate, Dan, and people talking about $1,000 whiskey shots and stuff like that. But Nice event, 15th Street Fisheries. Remember that, Scully? Yes, you do. And I do have some other news stories, but we'll get to those a little bit later. I know that those of you that are watching live are here waiting for Karen Knapp, who is sitting in the green room. So let me bring her out. Karen Knapp, executive leadership coach. If you've paid attention to the last couple of audio episodes, you will have heard us talking about all types of leadership styles and how to be a, a more effective, assertive leader. And we're here now to kind of close that conversation, maybe answer some questions. So, Karen, how are you doing? I'm great. So good to be here with you again. All right. So sorry about the audio difficulties, but thank you for pushing through and hanging out. Mm-hmm. No worries. So let me first ask. Uh, in terms of the last couple of episodes, I know that I've gotten a lot of comments. I got some emails and stuff, and I saw that you had posted to some of your friends and colleagues uh, any good feedback that you've heard. Mm-hmm. Lots of people in my network responded that it's, this is really important information to be sharing. Um, they were happy that we were talking about it together and that there's another way for people to come across these different communication styles and learn more about being assertive and how helpful that is in growing a small business or being a solopreneur. So I know that when we were talking, that kind of came up as a half question about how people find out that they need this type of conversation. I mean, I guess we always think, yeah, I want to know how to be a better leader. But when we talk about how to be a better communicator, it's always public speaking or, you know, doing presentations on stage. It's never really about how to communicate with your coworkers or your mm-hmm. employees. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, that type of, those are really the most important relationships to be a good communicator in because those are your people that are going to make or break your business, you know, particularly with customers and things like that. So if you burn bridges or you have conflict that you don't know how to resolve, you know, those customers could go away. Those employees might, you know, find other places to work. And the long-term mm, effects are going to be not good for your business. Right. So it is important to look at this stuff sooner rather than later. All right. Uh, so, folks, I know that if this is your first time watching the show, you may not know what we're talking about. But the previous two podcasts that I did with Karen, episodes 597 and 598, you can find over uh, on the website, the itbusinesspodcast.com, or just search for them in your favorite podcatcher, and you can go back. We're not going to recap those entire episodes because you can go and listen to them for yourselves. Well, we talked about four different styles of leadership, and then we focus on the most preferred being the assertive mm-hmm. leadership. Um. Some of the questions and comments that I got back, let me go back and see. I thought I saw one where, oh, it was, uh, they were trying to understand the passive aggressive style mm-hmm. and understanding mm-hmm. that, you know, you had given some key indicators as to what the, well, looks like we lost Karen. We're having technical difficulties everywhere, folks. So it's not just me. Weird. And you're back. I don't know what happened. (laughs) You know what? I think I'm going to say a little prayer. Dear Lord, please, I apologize for broadcasting on Valentine's Day. I did give my wife a great gift. She loved it. 
let us finish the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sweet. So sweet. Uh, we were um, uh, talking about the passive aggressive leadership style and you had given some indicators, you know, how do you know if somebody's being passive aggressive? But one of my listeners wrote that there's a second side that should be mentioned that, you know, a deep sigh, you know, may not necessarily be passive aggressive. It could be, you know, another thing, especially with somebody who is uh, socially inept or wants to see something that might not be there. Uh, they talked about eye rolls and all of that stuff. So I guess the question is, obviously, we can interpret things different ways, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason why I brought those things up is because as when you're assessing your own style, you want to be aware how those things come across and translate to someone else. So how someone's going to hear that sigh or see that eye roll, they're going to see it in a particular way and they might not give you the benefit of the doubt. Right. Now, is that fair? No. <laughs> is it probably going to happen though? Yes. Right. So if that's something that you do, you want to be aware that other people might not necessarily know that you're not annoyed or you're not frustrated by those eye rolls or the sighing. So you might want to pay attention to that a little bit more and maybe even let people know, hey, this is, I just sigh a lot. <laughs> it's not personal. <laughs> or, you know what, this, I do have something with my eyes that make it hard to me. It's hard for me to focus sometimes if that's a tick or whatever. Right. Um, don't take it personally. And that's, again, a great way of letting people know, hey, I know you're seeing something. I don't want you to misinterpret me. And that's my job. If I do something that I can't help or it's just my style, to do my best to let people know that it's not personal and that'll help. So we'd like to say that people should be aware of these things in the world around us and shouldn't, you know, make assumptions and should give us the benefit of the doubt. But honestly, a lot of times they don't. So if we can communicate some of the ways that we, you know, the things that we do that might be a little bit different, that'll help. Right. You know, for example, another example is, you know, when you have your phone out, sometimes people can interpret that as you're, you're being distracted or you're not paying attention. That could not be the case at all, but it's better to say something like, Hey, you know, I'm expecting an important phone call from my daughter or from my mother or a situation. I'm, I'm not really distracted. I'm just, that's just what's going on right now is I'm going to need to take that phone call. That way the other person can relax, know that you're not, you know, not paying attention or not present in the way that they might think. So that that phone thing is a good one because I know that I've been talking with clients and if my phone starts ringing, they almost expect that I'm going to grab it and answer it. And there's a lot of times where I don't. I I don't even look to see who it is and they'll ask, do you need to get that? I'm like, no, I'm my time right now is here with you. So let's move on. They're almost shocked, I think. Right. Because we right. are so used to, you know, every little ding, you know, oh, what's, you know, <laughs> what's, yeah. what's going on there. So that that's probably one of the toughest ones right now between texting and phones and alerts, especially text. We get so many alerts on our phones. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it is, you know, it is unfortunate and people don't mean it to be that way. Um, but, you know, and it's really hard to put your phone away when you're talking and being with in the presence of someone else. And there might be a good reason to have it out, but it might be something to think about, you know, can I put my phone away? Can I put it on silent? Otherwise having it dinging and looking at it all the time and even maybe taking a phone call gives a message that the person in front of me isn't as important as what's happening on my phone right now, which I'm sure isn't really the case. You don't want to give that message, but from being on the other side of that, we've all been on the other side of that where somebody's checking their phone when they're supposed to be talking with us. It doesn't feel very good. And so again, are these things fair to be sort of judged in a certain way? No, but that's what's happening. And so the more we can be aware of how, you know, we want to be perceived, if we want to be perceived as someone who's paying attention present that's that's something to keep in mind is to set that phone to silent or be able to put it away if if you're able to Um, all right so i'm going to divert a little bit from what we planned i want to ask a question and you tell me if 
if I handled this properly or not. Okay. So I used to have a practice where if I was in a meeting with a client and they kept taking phone calls while mm. I was in with them or kept allowing us to be interrupted, I would leave. <laughs> okay. Now, they would ask, why are you leaving? I'm like, because obviously this isn't important to you right now and my time is valuable. Because that was always one of the things that they complained about is, you know, you cost us so much money. Well, if you would stop letting people interrupt us, I wouldn't have to be here so long. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, there were a couple of times I just would get up and leave or – and here's where I really uh, – if I got left on hold, if somebody called me up and needed help or wanted to answer – you know, me to answer a question and I'm talking and they're like, hang on just a second. If they didn't come back in two to three minutes, I'd hang up. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I don't think that would be a surprise for okay. someone on the other end. Okay. Right? I mean, I hope they wouldn't be surprised. I hope they would feel bad and call you back and apologize. No, right? they always they always call back and say, oh, I think we got disconnected. And I so would love to say, <laughs> yeah, I know we got disconnected because <laughs> I'm the one who did it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, it wasn't an accident. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is there – I don't know if you went back and you know went over notes on what we discussed or anything, but was there maybe a point or something that you thought, oh, we really should have driven that home? Sure. Yeah, kind of at the, the end of the second one, we were talking about um, how much you can control and you can't control when you're in a conversation with somebody. And so we were talking about how – our job is we only have 50% of the responsibility in a relationship. The other person has 50% as well. So when we're being aggressive, we essentially take zero responsibility for anything that happens. We're, we're, we're blaming the other person for everything. It's all your fault. When we're being passive, we are assuming all the responsibility, 100%. It's all my fault, and it's not your fault at all. So when we're being assertive, we really actually, part of it is visualizing, like we're meeting in the middle. I'm responsible for part of this conflict or part of this miscommunication, and you're responsible for the other part. So I can own my part. I can work on my part, but I can't do the whole thing. And finding where that line is in our relationships is sort of an advanced skill, right? It's not, an, it's not always easy. Sometimes it's subtle. How much do I need to own up to and how much do I need to expect from the other person to meet me halfway? If we're used to being more on one extreme or the other, finding that middle ground is going to seem very strange at first. It's, not, it's going to be confusing. And so getting some guidance or help with that is, is sometimes necessary. Right. Now, I can imagine that that would be easier if you're on the same level as the other person, your colleagues, uh, your associates. But if you're the boss talking to an employee or you're the mm -hmm. employee mm -hmm. talking with the boss, it doesn't, doesn't seem like that would be as easy to take mm -hmm. that 50-50 approach. Is, mm -hmm. is there a way that you can kind of do it and, you know, make it work? Well, right. So this is, this, I mean, you have, you're, you'll have lots of people saying, you know, I didn't get like as employees or, you know, subcontractors, like I didn't get clear direction. I didn't know what to do. They never taught me how to do this. Right. There's, they're basically saying I didn't get good training on this. And that's my excuse. And that's probably very true <laughs> that yeah. the training they were supposed to get from their manager or their leader wasn't adequate. And you'll have the leader saying, you know, they're lazy. They didn't follow through. They're not picking this up quick enough. Is that also true? Perhaps, right? But both of those folks need to recognize, you know, as the leader, I want to be able to say, I trained this person adequately. I onboarded them properly. I taught them what I needed them to know. And I double checked and made sure before I left them. That's something that a lot of managers struggle with in terms of training and onboarding. Likewise, you have to have an employee who's, 
you know, invested enough to say, I, I took notes. I did the best I could to figure out what you wanted. I tried the process and it didn't work. Yeah, that's, you're doing everything you can, but not all employees do that. Right. Sometimes they don't take notes, they don't pay attention, and then they say, I don't know what to do. So again, you can see that there's two parts or two sides to that story. And we all have a, we all have to own our part in whatever difficulty we have. So right. you used yeah. a great tech word that we love onboarding. <laughs> uh, we usually talk about that when we're onboarding clients mm -hmm. and we're, you know, doing all of our setups and we're setting expectations on, you mm -hmm. know, how communication is done. How do you create a ticket? You know, when should you expect a response <laughs> and an answer? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that you, you mentioned, you know, employees, we don't necessarily see that as onboarding, but technically it is when you're talking mm -hmm. about bringing them into the company, showing them how we do things here. And I know that a lot of us as tech leaders run into those situations where we want technicians who are self-motivated, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to figuring out problems because – as much as we love Google, as much, as much as we try to put together our documentation and stuff, not every problem is going to be straightforward and it's not going to follow a checklist. So having technicians that can, you know, go beyond that training or onboarding is, is a big skill, I think, that, that we want, but we don't know how to quantify it. Mm -hmm. Learned that word from you last week. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, right. um, in terms of how to look for it, I guess. Right. So one of the biggest themes of assertiveness and assertive leadership is being proactive rather than reactive. So to your point here, this a proactive approach, bringing somebody on or training them would be doing what kind of we just talked about, setting up expectations clearly at the beginning, uh, having a thorough orientation checking in with people as they're getting going in the first few weeks or the first few months and making sure they're doing things the way that you'd like them to do them. Um, and and the, the problem, though, is it takes more time, right? I mean, you're hiring somebody, you want them to be able to hit the ground running. So that's what I often hear from leaders is they, they're so frustrated that they can't just, you know, give the person the task and set them free because they got other work to do right. over here, yep. you know? And I have to really say, you know, I have to coach them and say, look, I mean, you can try that, but you might have more problems down the line, which is going to suck up even more of your time. And if you want to save time, it's actually going to have to look like you're going to take the time now to get this person trained and checking, checking on them and making sure they're doing everything the way you want them to do it so that later on you don't have that, you don't have to worry about that. And for a lot of business leaders, I mean, that's one of the reasons why they don't do it is quite frankly, because they're too busy, you know? So when, when we think about why don't people, why aren't people assertive all the time? Well, that's one good reason that their environment is so he hectic or frantic. They're so busy. They can't actually spend the time or they don't think that they can spend the time um, to set up those expectations. Another reason, quite frankly, is that they just don't have the knowledge to, to know how to do it. Um, that being assertive for them is, is really just, an education game. And so hopefully by listening to the things that we've talked about in the last couple of podcasts, we can alleviate that or people can learn quite a bit from what the things that we've talked about. So they will have the knowledge, but if their environment's tricky and they're super busy and, you know, just not maybe, maybe not even that organized, they're going to have a harder time implementing some of these things. So they're more reactive to crises or right. putting fires out, right. Versus being proactive. All right. Uh, I'm going through the notes here to see if there's a question I want to bring up here. Um, oh, gossip can be mistaken for a legit warning. Now, I okay. wasn't able to go back to the listener and ask what they meant by it. I'm, I'm going to kind of guess. Uh, okay. We talked about gossip in the sense of that passive aggressive nature, right. uh, mm -hmm. kind of undermining stuff. But there's a lot of times – I'm going to guess that the person meant, you know, sometimes gossip is just downright sabotage and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. passive aggressive. It's, it's aggressive <laughs> and in a sense. Well, 
Right. I mean, unless you're going to the person directly, though, and telling them those things to their face, which that's not really gossip. That's just being in their face. You know, being <laughs> so the mean. gossip is, yeah, being mean. So gossip to me implies I'm talking about someone else who's not in the room in a negative way and try, trying to make them look bad. And so that if you're going to that person's face and telling them the things that are bothering you or that you're frustrated with, you know, that you're at least you're being honest, but being passive aggressive and gossiping, you're, you're being dishonest because you're not actually telling them directly what your issue is. You're telling someone else who probably can't help. Right. Or that's usually right. where you go to somebody else that they're not the manager. They're not the leader that can actually intervene and do something. You're just talking to another colleague or someone else who maybe will commiserate with you. So that actually is a really detrimental part of, and, and yeah, it's, doesn't ever end well. Okay. Uh, I know I asked you about possibly trying to drill down more into assertive leadership and the Mm -hmm. types of things that we can do to make sure we're doing it in the right way. Uh, What can you advise us on that? Mm -hmm. So really going back to the idea of how can you be proactive in all ways? Can you be proactive even before you need to have what's going to be a negotiation? Can you think ahead of time what you want that to look like, what you want the outcome to be, how you're going to prepare for it? Winging things (laughs) and just sort of going with the flow and being reactive. You know, it may work for some people and it doesn't work for a lot of people. So if you're winging things a lot, you're just going in there and just hoping for the best and waiting for the other person to call the shots. Oftentimes you're left feeling kind of unsettled or, you know, unresolved in whatever conversation you're having. So, you know, these aren't like day to day conversations that aren't that aren't like difficult. These are I'm talking about, you know, negotiations or, um, you know, trying to resolve an ongoing issue or conflict that hasn't been getting any better despite some reminders, things like that. So you don't want to wing those things. Right. So pausing, really thinking through, how do I want this to go? What, what is my issue? Kind of using those four steps that we talked about last time, which is what is my issue? What's the actual thing that I'm bothered by? How does it affect me? Meaning what, how I feel about it? What do I want to happen instead? What's my boundary? And then what will I do to help the situation change? What what can I do on my end to support this change proactively? So that takes a little bit of time and thought before you go into a negotiation or, or a conflict to be able to figure out what, where you stand on it. But it'll help things smooth over immensely if you do that. All right. I should have gone back to the chat a little while ago. I want to say, so I can't respond in the chat to people watching from LinkedIn, but I want to say thank you for, to Katie for saying that we're doing a great job <laughs> despite all this stuff that's been going on. And uh, shout out to uh, Kyle and somebody named Index hanging out in the chat as well. And I saw some other people earlier. I uh, don't know if they made the transition, but thank you all for hanging out here. Let me do this real quick. We're a little behind schedule, but. Um, I do want to at least give a shout out to our sponsor, Net Ally, uh, for being the presenting sponsor for the show. We are not going to play any commercials because I want to keep on moving here. I also want to give a shout out to Super Ops, who is my mud sponsor for the show. They are also sponsoring the Florida Man segment. And our live stream sponsor, Computers Done Right. And thank you all for supporting the show. And then I also want to give a shout out to a lot of the patrons. Those are the people that when I want to get feedback on the show and uh, ask what types of questions I should be asking our guests, uh, those are the ones that uh, reach out to us. And uh, so Jason, Jason, Kyle, Tom, Clark, no, I'm just, I'm not reading names from the Bible. Those are actual patrons. Uh, you can go support the show over at itbusinesspodcast.com. Uh, we're not doing the commercial, but I do want to make sure that I let everybody know that the queue is back. Uh, I talked about it last week. I did not talk about it on any of the 
other shows, but if you head over to the website and click on the queue, the question of the month, let me put it in the chat here for those of you watching. You can, I mean, don't go over there and do it right now. Stay and listen to the show, but click on it a little bit later. Uh, two questions this month, and if you participate, you'll be eligible for an Amazon gift card. And question number one, what is your favorite Toby Keith song? We lost Toby this month, and a lot of you reached out to me and thought I was going to have a country music meltdown, but uh, nope, we're fine. But uh, put in there, what is your favorite Toby Keith song? And then the second question, my good friend CJ uh, sends every email with please advise at the end. So I want to respond to him in a nice and positive way. So I'm looking for suggestions on how I should respond to she, to CJ and let him know that he doesn't have to put this please advise at the end of every email because it's annoying. It's, it's basically what it is for me. So. Do you have any assertive leadership lessons on how to respond to CJ? You know, the number one thing besides being proactive, that's one aspect, but then just being, being honest, right? Telling somebody being honest, but kind is that's assertiveness in a nutshell. So, Hey CJ, I don't know if you're doing that for me. You don't really need to. I'm okay. If you don't put that in there and let him and see what he says, you know, All right. if that's, so you're being, you're being nice and respectful, but also honest that, Hey, you don't really need to do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And let's see. Any other news? Um, let's see. I'm going to put a link to a story that uh, I saw. It made sense to move to managed IT services, and here's why. Uh, an article in Biz Community I think is an interesting article because uh, you know that people outside of the channel are always trying to encourage our customers on how to handle us. So I'll uh, put a link to that. I also want to put a link into a couple of ConnectWise notices. One of them is a press release that they are revolution, revolutionizing the future through robotic process automation. So they've done a bunch of stuff. If you are a ConnectWise user, you'll want to see what they've got going on. Or if you're considering them, they have uh, done a couple of things to streamline the search experience, enhance their onboarding process. Um, they're going to streamline their device and client management, uh, all with their robotic process stuff. So, uh, I know I'm not the news person. That's, uh, your friend DJ Dave over at uh, the business of tech, but, uh, connect wise was a big part of our show last year. And the last thing I want to mention is, con- let's see, connect wise has opened up their application process for the 2024 pitch it accelerator program. Um, if anybody out there runs into Sean Laro, tell him to stop ignoring my emails. I've reached out to him to see if he's going to have us join him with that program again. We did such a wonderful thing with him. We interviewed all 25 participants. Uh, we actually attended IT Nation and saw the final three compete for the $70,000 prize, uh, one by thread, by the way. And we even supplied the third place prize set of steak knives. And I don't know if that offended the IT Nation people, but um, Sean, let me know. Are we back in or not? But we'll still have the link for the applications for the 2024 Pitch It program for this year. All right. That's all the news. Back to our discussion at hand. So I don't think I've done a full introduction of you. You've got the guest page on the website, Karen, and we've uh, mentioned your website uh, KarenNab.com. Um, there is a K in there that is silent. So Karen K Nab. <laughs> if you're <laughs> phonetically spelling it out, but we did talk a little bit about the fact that you started off in family. I, don't, I was going to say family therapy. That's not the right yep. word. It is yep, family, therapy? family therapy. Okay. So mm-hmm. family therapy. And then you made the move into executive leadership and we talked about what kind of prompted you to do that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your practice as it is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So my business is NAB Consulting, and I have a few different ways that I work with people. So I do provide leadership coaching for executives, for nonprofit leaders, and solopreneurs. And that the things that we work on together are very interpersonally based. So um, the results that people find that they get are they're able to make decisions faster, they're able to feel more comfortable delegating, they're able to resolve conflict better, and the burnout is much reduced. So we work, really work towards having better balance, um, both within your workplace and then also in your personal life. So there's a lot of benefits to working with a coach, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who would want to do that. I also work with leadership teams, and I do focused conflict resolution sessions. So folks who are having a conflict that's been chronic, they've tried other things, nothing's really worked. I have a focused method where within easily within a month, we can really um, tackle that together. And I also work with business partners who may have some issue that's preventing them from working together very well. And same thing, it's a focused method that we work together for less than a month or less, and they can see really great results from that as well. So a few different areas that people call me All about. Right. Now, I think most of us understand those as usually leadership retreats where management will, you know, take off for a weekend and, you know, ski for part of it. And then they'll have the leadership sessions. Um, I don't think a lot of them, I mean, that's what the movies portray, but that's not what a lot of them do, is it? No. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, I work very closely with folks one-on-one and you may have, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, I've taken this assessment or, oh, I've done this leadership training and maybe they're not much better. So just because you took an assessment or just because you did a training and you're in a corporate environment, maybe you're still, maybe there's still things that you aren't great at. And, um, I think I really like working with folks who are more in a small business capacity who, you know, don't have as many of that, that they don't have that background necessarily to be so steeped in those corporate trainings where they, you know, they know what they know, they know their business really well. And yet, you know, they just like what we talked about through the last couple of episodes, these are basic skills that will really help anyone. And for some folks who kind of picked themselves up and started their own business by their bootstraps. I mean, these are things that they might not have come across in any other way. Um, And so I I do like to work with folks in that arena because they get so much value out of it and they feel so much more confident after we work together and they can go off and do some of these skills pretty easily on their own after, after we talk it through and they practice for a little bit. Right. So there's a couple of things you have on your site where Fostering a calm work environment sounds pretty self-explanatory. Um, but you also mentioned things about, you know, improving efficiency and, you know, increasing productivity and stuff. Is there a point in a business life where it's more advantageous to seek out a leadership coach, maybe at a certain plateau or after you get so many staff or, you know, maybe introduce, you know, an extra layer between management and employee is is there typical signs for that i mean there's definitely signs of you know business growth right so bringing employees on um and delegating that's a real sticking point for a lot of small business owners they really struggle to delegate and you know they might have hired people but they're not really giving them a lot to do (laughs) and so that's that's a place where you know if you can't manage that or, or grow through that, your your business is going to plateau for sure. Um, and then as you bring more and more people on, there's, there's a recipe for, there's just more interactions that are happening. There's more opportunities for conflict. Um, initially, not so much because people are just getting to know each other. But over time, as there's more water under the bridge, you could have things that have gone undealt with that continue to influence how people work together. So when I talk about efficiency and productivity, it has to do with things like people who aren't don't work well together because they have some beef with each other. And so they're really, they're really slow to respond to one another, for example, right? They'll take an extra couple days to respond to an email. 
or they'll forget to respond and then someone has to email them again a week later, right? So that that cost or they're unclear with their requests. So not knowing your communication style absolutely affects a business in the long term, especially as it gets bigger, because these little things grow into something else um, to the point where, you know, a company sometimes spends, I have it on my website, up to 20% of somebody's salary on miscommunication and rectifying misunderstandings and miscommunication or following up on things that weren't clear in the first place. So that's a huge cost. That could be a huge cost to any business, but particularly smaller businesses. And, you know, we could rectify that pretty quickly with some training and some coaching. Right. So. I'm trying to remember. I think I did ask you a question, but I don't think it was this particular way. Have you seen a big shift in trying to do this type of coaching since COVID, since we are now more remote than ever, it sometimes might be difficult to identify that these things are happening because you don't see each other. You don't talk on a regular basis, but yet those things are there. Um, are you dealing with those situations in this hybrid environment that we're in? Yeah, one of my specialties is working and identifying, I call it passive leadership or passive leaders and the, the qualities therein. Um, it's not to be critical or blame. It's more about people who aren't as comfortable being outspoken and sharing their ideas. And if that's a leader in a company, that's going to have a major ripple effect. So identifying where leaders can be more forthcoming, can be can communicate more and showing them how that's actually going to benefit them is often something that I work, work with folks on. So since COVID, yes, it's been a little bit harder to identify where that happens because you're not in the same space with people. But at the same time, I mean, you know, sending a weekly email is sending a weekly email. You either send it or you don't. And you know, if you don't update folks, if you're not regularly communicating in other ways with your people, that's something that isn't rapidly noticed, but will eventually be noticed. But I identify that very quickly in, in organizations because those are things that do slow down the productivity and the processes. And leaders can have a much bigger impact when they're aware that they're doing things that are slowing things down. So. Okay. All right. Let's see. How are we on time? Who moving right along? Uh, let me ask this one question because anytime I have somebody on and I mean, techies like free things. <laughs> and so of course they're like, Oh, is this stuff we have to pay for? Blah, blah, blah. But the question came is, do you have any simple exercises or things that we can do on our own or for free <laughs> that would help with improving communication at work? <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a few different things that I can recommend. Some are, I mean, they're, they're kind of in different, different areas of your work life. But the first thing I would say is stop gossiping. Okay. That's the number one thing I would say to improve your workplace communication in general, right? So if that's happening, you know, we talked about it before, it stirs the pot, it es gossip escalates conflict, it reduces sort of the trust level between people, between team members, and so it makes it harder to work together. So if that's something that you are doing or someone else is doing, you, you can work on not doing that or you could sort of let people know, hey, you're not comfortable with that going on. Um, and something else that is a, a very, kind of a different approach would be to to track your, not track your breathing, but breathing is the, the cheapest, <laughs> one of the best ways to help yourself when you're feeling triggered or upset. And so taking some deep breaths that, we're really, as we talked about before, that your brain chemistry is affected in, in a negative way when you're upset. Taking deep breaths reverses that. 
So you can do that. I recommend that to a lot of my clients. You can do that anywhere and nobody really has to know. You could do it in a meeting even that you're taking some deep breaths to try to de-escalate and calm yourself down so that you can re-engage and, and speak from a more a calmer, assertive place versus a more activated, triggered place. So that is free. You could go, like I said, in the, you could take a break. You could go to the bathroom. You could take a walk. All those things can help you basically calm down enough so that you can figure out what am I really upset about? How do I really want to communicate about this? So it, it don't underestimate the power of taking a break or breathing. Honestly, it's, it sounds silly, but it actually can make a huge difference because it's your brain. It's your physiology that you're trying to reverse, right? We talked about the adrenaline before and how if we can, we have to let the adrenaline go move through us for our amygdala to calm down, breathing can help act, can help us, you know, make that go faster. Okay. I was trying to think of that as like breathing exercises. One, if you get agitated or Mm -hmm. two, if you're walking into a conflict resolution situation, Mm -hmm. or even if you're just, you're the presenter at the committee meeting that day, Mm -hmm. doing those breathing exercises to calm down and all of that. Okay. Yeah. And just a quick one that a lot of it makes it makes the rounds. It's called box breathing. And so deep breathing, essentially Bo- you're, you're create, yes, okay. you're creating a box with your breath. So essentially you're inhaling for five seconds, holding for five seconds, exhaling for five seconds, holding for five seconds. And you could do that three to five times. And that can help. That's something very you know, specific, you can, you can use if you want to, there's other variations, but that's a common one. Okay. Interesting. Box breathing. Mm -hmm. Google that folks. (laughs) All right. All right. Well, let's, uh, I think that's good. We did pretty good. I, again, we are on time, had a little bit of a hiccup, but powered through. Thank you guys very much. We still have time to get our Florida man segment in. So we're going to do that. Did you prepare yourself? Oh, my gosh. I was hoping we would run out of time for that one. (laughs) I'm sure you were. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You were complaining that I gave you homework the last couple of podcasts. Now I'm going to complain that you had to give me homework. But you had an easy option. I guess. I mean, those questions don't sound so easy. (laughs) My alternative (laughs) questions, if I'm going to pick them out of a hat. (laughs) <laughs> they're random. Sometimes they're super easy. So, well, let me go ahead and ask you, what did, uh, what did you decide? Are you going to challenge Florida man with a story of your own or answer a random question? I mean, I, I have a sort of an, yeah, an urban, a story from Austin. I live in Austin, Texas. Okay. And I moved here a couple of years ago in 2021. Well, now it's three years ago, 2021. And for some reason, 2022, Things started to change. I know that when I moved here, it was a very, it's a very pretty city. There's, it's well kept up. There is some graffiti, but it's in expected places. But in 2022, something happened. There was somebody, a graffiti artist in quotes. I don't know if I could even say an artist. Started spray painting the word Buscar in the most outrageous places. Buscar is we all looked it up. It's a Spanish word. It means to to dance, right? No, that's bailar. It's to look for. I think. Oh, looky, to look for something. Looky here, yeah. or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they spray painted it not only on you know bridge overpasses, but on light posts, like going up along or on curbs, like smaller letters on fences, on roofs of businesses. Everywhere. Some of them were very elaborate. It was always the same word. And you saw it everywhere. And there was a lot of, like, they made the rounds on social media quite a bit, even to the point where it got its own news segment. Right. Like, who is this person? What do they want? Apparently, they don't want anything. It's not gang related. or It's just, like, for attention. We're not really even sure. But the person recently told, I don't know, somebody on social media, 
that they were done. They were tapping out. And I guess that, you know, that made the rounds too. So I found that on Nextdoor, which is an app that can has a lot of Florida man type stories. On it. <laughs> Nextdoor, have <laughs> yeah. you heard of that? Oh, oh that yeah. App? Oh, yeah. We, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've 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 almost thought about doing a podcast all based on next door stories. I mean, I just was like scrolling through next door, being like, "What crazy thing could I talk mm-hmm. about?" Because there's lots of stuff in there. Yep, but- um, we've got several neighborhoods around us where every day there's a video. Watch out for this person because they'll show mm. people walking up to houses and ch- right? you know, of course, checking cars and doing all that stuff. So yeah, mm-hmm. so so nobody ever found out why the person did it or did they, did they even find out who was doing it? Well, there was some people who were interviewed thought they knew who it was, but of course they wouldn't disclose. Of course. Right. And then they interviewed a college professor from UT Austin who studies sociology. And he determined that it was not a gang related situation, that okay. it was simply for attention. And he didn't say artistry, but yeah, it was so bizarre. And it was, they would, it was just everywhere for a while. Like every place you look, there was Buscar written <laughs> on it and every surface, like wow. signs and, you know, just everywhere. So a lot of people had to repaint over things to, you know, get that off. But anyway, you know, it's, it happens a lot in a lot of places. Austin though, didn't, it didn't have that vibe, you know, a few years before that. And now no, trying it does. to figure out what to do. Yeah. All right. So Florida man, a lot of stories to choose from uh, the last couple of days. <laughs> oh, you're going to pick one now too? Well, yeah, because because um, I always have so Are many. So here's, here's, so here's the stories I'm not going to read, okay? <laughs> Florida man arrested after posting YouTube video of himself allegedly fleeing police. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Florida man eating raw chicken every day for 100 days. And let's see. Florida man. Oh, drunk Florida man abandons airboat in front of sheriff substation. (laughs) But the story that I'm going to read. Florida man arrested after causing scene over handicapped parking space. Calls nine one one on responding officers. So, thirty nine year old Nicholas Taylor of the Villages, and that's a wonderful place here in Florida, uh, faces charges of disorderly intoxication and misuse of nine one one after he caused a scene at a Wawa gas station <laughs> in Lady Lake last Friday. Uh, basically. Uh, <laughs> The Lady Lake Police Department said in an affidavit attained by the station that Taylor called 911 after he noticed a vehicle was parked in a handicap space at the gas station despite not having a handicap a handicap permit. Taylor then marched into the store and caused a scene inside. Police said he was disrupting the flow of business because a car was illegally parked in the handicap spot. He allegedly threatened to fight the person who parked in the spot. So when the driver of the vehicle attempted to leave, he allegedly stood behind the car until police arrived. And while they were there, he continued to threaten to fight with the driver. Uh, What else? Yeah, he argued with the officers, demanded a police sergeant be sent to the scene. Uh, despite the officer saying he was the sergeant on duty, Taylor ignored him and dialed 911 to complain about the officers who responded to the Wawa to deal with him. So, he was arrested, taken to the jail, and uh, released after a $1,500 bond. That's a pretty good one. All at a Wawa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in florida yep how close where, where is it lake what is it lake lady lake? lake so that is the villages and lady lake are outside of orlando so okay. it is just about three hours north of here uh, the villages is a growing community that was originally supposed to be an over 55 type community but it is growing um it is probably 
it's going to be the size of Disney soon. Wow. And uh, it is it is it is said that every house comes with a golf cart. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That makes sense. Is it gated? Is that sort of the thing? Like you I don't know. I've, be... I've never been. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it's yeah, it's hard to know exactly what it looks like, what it is. If it's a town or if it's a gated community. It's, I, it's, it. well, it's a town now. It's got its own post office. So I know that. Oh, okay. But I don't, okay. I don't think it's gated. I, there may be gated portions of it. Yeah. I don't know if any of you out there, know about the villages. <laughs> Why didn't it let me know? Because uh, I do not know anybody who... Well, actually, I met a lady last night. I should have asked her. Mm. Well, it's okay. All right. Well, Karen, thank you for hanging out. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah. And Thanks for having me. I have a feeling we may, we may want to ask you back on from time to time if we get some leadership-type questions and need a go-to person to ask because mm-hmm. I'm not a, yeah, sounds great. I'm not a leadership guru. Well, after talking to me for well, a I've, while, all I need to do is learn how to say amygdala the right way. <laughs> Nailed it. You got it. Got it. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Karen Nab, uh, Karen Nab consulting and uh, all the links will be in the show notes to what we talked about, her website. You can uh, go there and check out. She's got um, she's got a discovery page that you can go and chat with her and get yourself some individual coaching for C-level leaders or team leadership coaching for executive teams. What's the rock formation on your website mean? Well, it's actually called a cairn. It's a C A I R N. Karen. Okay. So it sounds a little bit like Karen. Karen. <laughs> okay. It was my like hidden meaning. I don't know. <laughs> you have to pick something. <laughs> so. And and do you get to explain it a lot? Um. No. Just when people. <laughs> just when Yahoo's <laughs> like me it. ask. Yeah. <laughs> Very particular folks. Notice the details. I am, it's, there is some meaning there. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> it's just... Well, it just, yeah, it looks, sounds like my name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there'd be some like little Buddha, you know, right. Western Indies type, you know, mm. solitude and gratitude or something. I don't know. No. That's not really my style. Okay. <laughs> I'm like kicking rocks in a, in a riverbed, you know? Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. C-A-R-N, right? No, C-A-I-R-N. C-A-I-R-N. Mm-hmm. Okay. Look it up. I'm going to look it all up. All these pictures of... Stack rock. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to have a link in the show notes. <laughs> Great. <that. laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thank you uh, very much for those of you that hung with us through tonight's te- uh, technical difficulties, made it through the show. Thank you very much for uh, joining us live. If you're listening by audio, yeah, you missed it. You need to come here live and see what we go through. It's fun. Uh, check out uh, the website, itbusinesspodcast.com. Sign up there or any of the social media uh, to follow up on anything that we do here. You'll have all the links to Karen, our new friend, and our Karen rock formation that you can learn about. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's going to do it for tonight, folks. Um, Hope you all had a wonderful Valentine's Day and enjoyed time with loved ones and or friends, however you celebrate. And let's see here. If you're in Fort Lauderdale, say hello. I will be over at the MSP Expo tomorrow checking out swag. We'll be back next week with another episode. I don't know who's on, and I'm not going to go check it out, but uh, you can too uh, over at the website. Karen, thank you very much for hanging out. That's going to do it, folks. 
looking for the exit video. <laughs> We're so out of whack. That's going to do it, folks. Take care. Have a good night. We'll see you next time. And until then, holla.